Good evening, this is uh, Quintus Curtius. Welcome back to the podcast. And in this podcast, I'm going to talk about the release of my new translation, my new book, which is a translation of Cicero's On Moral Ends, De Finibus. And it was just released today. It's out uh, now in both paperback and Kindle. And there's a article that I also wrote on my site that has links to uh, find the book and purchase it, where you can find it and uh, see all the all the details. But the article also uh, talks in in great detail about what the book contains, and that's what I wanted to do in this podcast is to do an audio version of that and talk a little bit about the book, what it is, why it's important, why it's an important contribution to the field, and what special features it has, and why it can be used by anyone with no background in the classics uh, for enjoyment, for profit, and for for comprehension of this very, very important uh, philosophical classic. So let's go ahead and, and dive right in and just talk a little bit about this book. As I said, there's currently a paperback and audio, I'm sorry, a paperback and a Kindle version available. There will be an audio version also available, I would say probably within, you know, 60 days or so, maybe less. Uh, But um, it's a 365-page book, and it contains, uh, and it's the most detailed and involved translation I've done yet, and I think in many ways uh, the most difficult, but also the most rewarding, as such things often are. And it contains many useful and special features that make it ideal for the motivated self-learner or for classroom use. And as as I said earlier, it's fully self-contained. It's fully self-contained and it is designed both for the serious student and for those who have no prior background in classical studies. And these are the the features that it, the special features that it includes just to kind of rattle off a list of the highlights. Uh, Number one, obviously a clear, modern, and accurate translation gained from an intensive study of the original Latin text, which I think I've uh, demonstrated my proficiency to be able to uh, convey the original text in in an idiom that's modern, lucid, and clear. Uh, But really importantly, the, the second thing, it has 65 original photographs taken by me of the actual locations where the dialogues took place in in both Italy and in Greece, at Cumae and Tusculum in Italy, and at the Platonic Academy in Athens. And I think this is very significant because no one has ever done this before, in any uh, of uh, in any translation of, of on ends that I've ever seen. And these photos really, as I will explain, really do enhance comprehension and appreciation of the text. And besides photographs, the the book also contains additional illustrations. So it has, uh, you know, photographs of the original locations that I walked the ground at this year, and also some additional uh, photographs of other uh, sites, historical sites mentioned in the text that are relevant. It's got over 460 scholarly footnotes that explain every name, concept, and detail needed for comprehension. We have, uh, it also has a greatly improved formatting of the dialogues, as I'll explain later, using modern formatting conventions for ease of reading. Number five, a detailed topical organization table at the the beginning so that students and readers can quickly locate topics and and issues when they need to, which no one has ever done before, uh, as we know. Uh, And a detailed descriptive index. Um... Also, an extended introduction that explains the author's life and works, the organization and layout of the text, and most importantly, summaries of the three philosophical systems discussed in the book by Cicero. That would be Epicureanism, Stoicism, and the academic philosophy of Antiochus, of Ascalon. And there's also commentaries at the end of each book that assist the reader in understanding the text. So, there's a lot here, and I think... Readers will find it a very, very rewarding experience, um, provided it's approached in the right way. You know, don't try to bite off too much. You know, read it in, in, in small small doses, because there's a lot there. 
and obviously it can be uh, overwhelming. You know, if too much, uh, too much at one time can be overwhelming. So, so be, keep that in mind. Um, what I'm going to do now is read from the foreword. I'm just going to read a selection, uh, read an excerpt from the book's foreword, which tells a little bit about the book and and why I did what I did. So I'll, I will go ahead and do that. This book is a translation of Cicero's philosophical work on moral ends. Its full Latin title is De Finibus Bonorum et Malorum, but this is often shortened to De Finibus. The meaning of the title will be discussed in the introduction. The work is a series of dialogues in which the speakers debate the competing views of three different influential philosophical schools of Cicero's day, Epicureanism, Stoicism, and the academic that is Platonist philosophy of Antiochus of Ascalon. The unifying theme of the dialogues is the search for answers to the following questions. Number one, what is our end? That is, our, the, the final objective or ultimate goal of human life that provides us with a rational plan for living happily and doing good works. Number two, what is the most desirable principle sought after by nature? And number three, what is the greatest evil that nature avoids? On Moral Ends is thus a work of moral or ethical philosophy. In three separate dialogues, Cicero's speakers guide us through the intricacies of each of these competing schools of thought. We thereby hear proposed answers to the questions noted above. The beauty and value of the work lies not so much in its conclusions, for these are open to differing interpretations, but rather in how each speaker argues his corner and makes his case. It is a rigorous treatise, and perhaps Cicero's most intensely focused, but the rewards it offers are beyond valuation. If the reader can complete the journey to the end of the fifth book, he or she will have gained a deep and nuanced appreciation of some of life's most fundamental questions. Cicero's passion for the subject matter shine through uh, on every page and help make the reader's sojourn a memorable and moving experience. This foreword will explain the special features included in this book. The introduction that follows it will provide background information essential for an understanding of the text of On Moral Ends. My goal was to produce an English rendition of the Latin text that would be as clear, modern, and faithful to the original as possible. On Moral Ends is a detailed and sometimes technical work, yet also frequently conversational and argumentative. It rises to soaring and inspiring eloquence, especially, especially in Book 5. The translator must be able to articulate these divergent literary qualities in modern, lucid English. It is his responsibility to convey the flavor of Cicero's elegant Latin through the use of appropriate English idiom, phrasing, sentence structure, rhythm, and overall tone. If an original author is eloquent, passionate, and disputatious, then his translator must try to convey these qualities using the tools his own language gives him. Translators love to talk about translating, and I am no exception. We are fond of pronouncing our theories of translation and reminding readers of the difficulties we have overcome. Every sculptor is proud of his chisel, and every painter defensive of his brush. Translation is an interpretive art. One is conveying words, ideas, idioms, and rhetorical flavors from one verbal universe to another. The translator must not only know his text well, but he must know his author well. He must be attuned to his likes, dislikes, peccadillos, personality, and idiosyncrasies. I believe an original text should be preserved in form and spirit by a careful attention to its rhetorical style, grammatical, grammatical constructions, and idiomatic peculiarities. When a literary work in Latin or any other language is translated into English, all of English's flexible tools must be deployed with these purposes in mind. The act of translation must challenge and, I am not afraid to say it, torment the translator so that he or she is forced to invent novel structures, phrases, and stylistic devices to evoke a different world. Brute labor must be enlightened by bursts of innovative creativity. But this is not all. In a serious and detailed philosophical work, it is important to present the text in a way that enhances understanding. 
Too often, translators of classical literature have failed to appreciate just how much a text's appearance, formatting, and presentation can contribute to or detract from a reader's comprehension. As I explained below, I have opted to use modern conventions in the formatting of the dialogues. It is often forgotten that On Moral Ends is, after all, a series of dialogues. It was written as a set of dialogues, and we should read it as such. Its interpretation should begin from this reference point. Some editors of classical texts choose to format dialogues such that the successive statements and responses of speakers are placed alongside each other, one after the other, in single, cumbersome paragraphs. This may be due to a desire to save printing space or costs, or it may be due to a lack of concern for the needs of readers. In any case, the final result often resembles a hodgepodge of quotation marks, commas, and verbiage that is frustratingly difficult for the eyes to follow. The reader begins to lose track of who is saying what to whom and inevitably loses interest. The reader of a philosophical text deserves better. He has enough challenges on his plate without having to suffer through bad formatting and presentation. Clearly, the old printing conventions were unacceptable. A new approach was needed in presenting the dialogues. I have opted to use modern dialogue formatting where each speaker's statement gets its own separate indented paragraph. Statements and responses follow in, successive, in, follow in succession down the page and the reader can easily see who is saying what to whom. Legibility is enhanced and comprehension is strengthened. Footnotes in the text explain every name, concept, or point that requires explanation. Preceding this forward, I have created a special table of contents as an aid to perusing the text and locating subjects easily. The reader can see at a glance what topics are in each book and chapter and will know on what page that subject can be found. This method is more efficient and useful than embedding marginal notes within the text. Commentaries are included at the end of each book, and in the introduction, I have also included something that was sorely needed a table that cross-references each dialogue by speaker, topic, date, and location. I strongly believe that, before plunging into the waters of On Moral Ends, the reader should have a basic understanding of Epicureanism, Stoicism, and the moral philosophy of the later academy. I have provided this information in the introduction. My goal is to equip the reader with no prior experience in the, in the subject matter, with every tool needed to understand and appreciate on moral ends, and to do this in one self-contained volume. This was the approach taken in my translations of On Duties and Sallust, and it was well received by readers. For this reason, I believe this book is ideal for classroom use, as well as for the motivated self-learner. I have included original photographs of the three locations of the dialogues, Tusculum and Cumae in Italy, and Athens in Greece. All of the photographs in this book were taken by me in the spring and summer of 2018. There are two reasons why I believe the inclusion of photographs is important. Firstly, the fatigued mind needs visual refreshment when working its way through a serious text. The presence of photographic images can provide a psychological break, a cheerful distraction, and will contribute to preserving the reader's endurance. To this same purpose, I have included additional illustrations on the opening page of each of the five books, as well as at the end. Secondly, I thought that if the reader could actually see what Tusculum, Cumae, and the Platonic Academy in Athens looked like, he or she would gain a more intimate appreciation of the settings of the dialogues. I have included photographs of other locations in Athens and Italy where their presence would contribute to an appreciation of the text. Thus, the reader will find images of Italy's Amalfi Coast, the Dipilon Gate in Athens, mentioned in Book 5, Section 1, Aristotle's Lyceum, the home of the Peripatetics, Keramekos, the Temple of the Olympian Zeus, and the Roman Agora in Athens. The charm of a place becomes indelibly linked to the understanding of an idea. As Cicero himself says in Book 5, Section 4, Quote, the intangible spirit that resides in the former haunts of great men evokes their memories with more clarity and resonance. We very much agree with him. If we can see what a place looked like, 
if we can get a sense of the terrain, then we will add something special and intangible to our comprehension. Perhaps the reader will bear with me as I explain these pilgrimages. I visited the secluded ruins of Tusculum in May 2018. It is located in the beautiful Alban Hills outside Rome, and to get there, I took a train from Rome to Frascati in the early morning, then walked along winding roads for about an hour to reach the site. The conditions for such a visit could not have been more ideal. The weather was pristine, the spot almost deserted, and an archaeological dig happened to be in progress. As I walked about Tusculum, I happened to see an exposed skull lying in view in one of the pits, which to me was a startling reminder of the Stoic admonition to remember our own mortality. As the reader will see from the photographs in the text, Tusculum is a tranquil and secluded place, an ideal setting for a gathering of friends to talk philosophy. Cicero's villa there must have been a restful escape from the fury of Roman politics. Several days later, I drove with a friend to Naples, seeing the Amalfi Coast along the way. We explored the impressive ruins of Cumae, with its strange mixture of seaside charm and prophetic gravity. After all these centuries, one feels that the cave of the Sibyl still jealously guards its secrets. Athens I visited in August 2018. The dialogue in Book 5 takes place at the site of the Platonic Academy, and it was this hallowed ground that I needed to visit. It turned out to be a very short walk, first along Eleftsinian Street, then Lenormen, then Alexandrias, and then finally the ground of the old academy itself. The ruins are located in a public park in a residential area. In early morning, early morning it is serene and quiet, with dog walkers, joggers, and elderly people starting their days. We are told that the site was only discovered in the, in the 20th century. Before that, scholars had a general idea of its location, but not a precise one. In classical times, it was located in the midst of groves away from the city. Now, of course, it is within the city, since Athens has expanded to absorb it. The only site that was marked was that of the old gymnasium. The palestra dates from a later period, probably the first century AD. There was even a cistern for the students' bathing. Book learning and physical fitness went hand in hand, a lesson that should not be lost on us today. The site is still largely unmarked. It deserves restoration, but this is likely to have to wait future generations. It appears to me that the Academy originally had different clusters of buildings, possibly lecture halls, classrooms, or libraries. As I walked the grounds, I indulged my romantic impulses with some fanciful musings. O oh, stones, ye have here rested three and twenty centuries. Ye sturdily kept a continent's foundation when Europe was young. Ye heard the laughter of youth, the pleas of truth's seekers, and the disputations of the great. Ye have witnessed the master speak of the divine forms, and of the secrets of their emanations. Ye knew Aristotle in his noble, noble prime, and felt the learned perambulations of Spusippus, Xenocrates, Polemo, and a hundred other names now lost in time's swirling mists, and ye laughed at the follies of empires and kings. Speak, ye stones, and say what secret lieth within ye. There was no response, of course. Yet as I walked through the place, the bees still hummed about the ruins, and the birds engrossed in their domestic tasks, still tweeted and chirped, and the academy still rioted with tangled foliage and brambles. Life has inherited the academy. Its stones speak not, but the living world surrounds and envelops them and speaks for them in its own reverential tones. And so we may say that the academy is, in its own way, still alive. It lives in accordance with nature. And as I left the place... I reflected much on these things. Every era needs instruction on how to live. We desire counsel on what is important and what is not. We wish to know what our ultimate goals and purposes should be in this life and how such goals may be attained. Modern science, as we know, 
continues to advance so rapidly that we feel imprisoned in a perpetual state of bewilderment. We have come to expect dislocating surprises around nearly every corner. Science has achieved undoubted glories in the advancement of health, the banishment of disease, and the understanding of the natural world. And yet, despite all this, we feel keenly the fraying of the social fabric, the marginalization of ancient institutions, and the steady replacement of the solace provided by community and neighbor with the frightening atomization of the individual. These are not insignificant problems. What is needed, perhaps, is rigorous instruction on the science of living life and the importance of virtue. As, as Leo Tolstoy once noted, people must live, but in order to live they must know how to live. And men have always obtained this knowledge, well or ill, and in conformity with it have lived and progressed. And this knowledge of how men should live has, from the days of Moses, Solon, and Confucius, always been considered a science, the very essence of science. And this is really what more On Moral Ends is about. The book rises to this challenge and gives us this crucial instruction. We may not agree with some of its conclusions, but what matters is how it arrives at those conclusions. Our exposure to its methods stimulates the engine of character development. And this really is what On Moral Ends is about. So I would encourage you to take a look and to check the work out, and any further questions or comments on On Moral Ends may be directed to me at my email address at uh, qcurtius at gmail.com. That will be all for today. I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night.